Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Now this prayer that Paul expresses for these saints in Thessalonica is worthy of our attention for today's worship. Sometimes we have to stop and not just pass over certain words and, and um, we could just as easily have, but it seems like a good time to focus in this morning and uh, consider this thing of being established in every good word. And that's what we'll talk about today. I pray the Lord will bless this to our hearts, will teach it to us, that we won't just sit and agree with it. It's so easy to do that. It, it seems fulfilling to, to hear something agreeable, but that's just agreeing with it is not the point of it. That's a good start. But uh, we pray the Lord will actually do this for us, establish us in every good word, and let's pray he'll show us what that is and that he'll be glorified in that through us. Remember that Paul's desire is that Jesus Christ himself, even God, even our Father, his desire is that he himself might do this for us. Again, it's easy to miss things like that. This is not something we're going to figure out and work up on our own. This is a blessing from God. Uh, I've used this illustration many times, but people, you know, they'll put a sign on their church saying, we're going to have a revival. Well, you don't have revivals. The Lord does that. And he may show up or he may not. You don't, you don't schedule that. Um, you pray for it. You ask God for it. And so this word establish, it means simply to make firm and strong, to, make, to establish, to make firm and strong. And he desires that in these two things, in every good word and every good work. And there are two ways to be established in every good word. First of all, inwardly. To be on firm ground when it comes to the doctrine of Christ, to be well versed, to be um, studious of it. But more than that, for God to, I like what David said, Lord, hide your word in my heart. I'm not sure we can do that. I'm pretty sure we can't do that. God's got to do that. Hide your word in my heart that I might honor you that I might not sin against you. And that's what we're talking about here, to be established inwardly, to be on firm ground when it comes to the doctrine of Christ, not only to be able to answer those that ask a reason for the hope that lieth within you, but to be an example, in, uh, to live the word, and to be an example, which would be the work part, every good work. But I mean, let's talk about being established in every good word. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4 in pursuit of that. Ephesians chapter 4. The scripture defines these things when the scripture tells us a uh, a concept like that of being established in every good word. You're not going to find a definition of that if, uh, in your experience or in your, though, even though you may exper have experienced it, but the definition of it is in the scriptures. And here's, here's part of it right here, Ephesians 4, 11. And, and the Lord gave some apostles <clears throat> in the old days and some prophets even farther back than that, and some evangelists, some that traveled and preached like the apostle Paul, and some pastors. These are like Timothy that stayed and pastored a church and teachers of the gospel. For the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing or the completing to 
establish the saints in every good work. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. That's the church. The church is his body. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. All of us are worshiping the same God. Somebody comes in here and and, and um, by, by definition of what how they identify themselves, they're not worshiping the same God we do. And that's where the preaching of the gospel comes in. Those who hear of Christ and fall in love with Christ, they're going to assemble together. We're going to be, there's a unity unto a perfect man, a mature, complete body, unto the measure of the stature of, of the fullness of Christ. This all has to do with Christ. We're his body. It's his church. It's his Bible. It's his word. It's his gospel. That we henceforth, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. If you don't have that foundation, this word establish in our text, if you don't have that then the the last person that you hear that sounds reasonable and sounds like they know what they're talking about, you're going to go that way. You're going to be carried about with every wind of teaching. You don't have an anchor for your soul like the Lord Jesus Christ is to his people. And it's by the slight of men. They know how to do it. They know how to do it. The cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. They're looking to deceive people. They're trying to build, you know, how to build a church. You know, you you do these sneaky, inappropriate, blasphemous, flesh-centered things and people will flock, you know, and get together and give money. But here's what happens in God's church. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. The whole goal of all of it, the purpose of all of it, is to grow up into Christ, to be made more like him. Somebody said, uh, somebody that made a beautiful statue of a horse, how in the world do you get it to look so real? You say, well, I just get a chunk of granite and I knock off everything that doesn't look like a horse. The Lord's doing that for his people. He's knocking it off of us, isn't he? He's chiseling us out. It's not that we get more and more holy, but we, we, we grow in his grace. We grow up into him. From which the whole body, verse 16, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, Make its increase of the body unto the building up of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. So you see this establishment, this coming together in the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. Don't miss those words in verse 13. The knowledge of the Son of God. Where all this week have you gotten any knowledge of the Son of God? Probably not much except here on Wednesday night and this morning and last Sunday. It's when we get together and look into the things of Christ together and learn of him, take his yoke upon us. So notice in that passage that the way to be strong in the gospel, the way to be established and to come together in unity is how? Speaking the truth in love. He gives what for this purpose, for this establishment, for this... When it says that he built his church on the rock, and the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, the rock of ages. And how does he do that? He gives apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. What, what do all those have in common? Speaking 
the word of truth. Here we are again. How many times in our studies do we come back? We need to hear from God. That's how God does what he does for us and in us now as believers by his gospel. All right, look at Hebrews 13 with me, please. Hebrews chapter 13. Let's see if we can find a theme regarding this. Remember, we're talking about being established. Don't you want that? Don't, don't, you don't want to sink roots into this world. This world's going to burn up and you with it if you're sunk. If your roots are sunk into this earth, the rocky, cold, God-hating crags of this earth. For, uh, chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conduct, of, of what they're doing, of what they do, considering the purpose of it, the goal of it. What is that? Jesus Christ. You see how simple the scripture is? The Bible doesn't say a lot of things. It says the same thing a lot of different ways in different times and different times. Jesus Christ, the whole purpose of it all. We're growing up into who? If you follow the faith, not the man, the faith that he preaches, the, the gospel of, of salvation by faith and not works. Where are you headed? <laughs> Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. That's why it's a firm ground because he don't change. The truth don't change. No matter what storm you're in, no matter whether you're on the mountain or in the deep, dark valley, he's the rock, the rock upon which we stand. The Lord is my rock, whom shall I fear? Be not carried about, verse nine, with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Grace as opposed to what? Is the establishment of the heart grace by us? Is that what he's saying? Be gracious to other people and that's the step? No, it's clear in the context. He's saying grace not meets. Grace not religious observances. Grace not you living the Christian life. Meets is talking about they... They had religiously set up all these little rules that you can't do this and you can do that and you'll please God. No, you won't. Christ pleased God and you're not ever going to unless you're in Christ. Not me. It's the doctrine of grace he's talking about. He just talked about the word, the preaching. Let your heart be established with the truth of grace. The gospel of grace in Christ not meats which have not profited them that have, that have been occupied therein. It's not going to help you spiritually in any way to eat certain things or not eat certain things. <coughs> what helps you spiritually is grace, the grace of God. What saves a sinner is grace. And we preach Christ because God's grace is in him. There's grace for sinners because he shed his blood. There's grace for sinners because he loves with an everlasting love. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Those that do the works of the law and by that means expect to be justified before God, they can't eat at this altar. There's no place for that at the table of Christ. Same prerequisite, though, in this chapter. It's those who are taught sound doctrine that inwardly are rooted and grounded in the faith of that doctrine. Look at verses 14 and 15 back in our text. 2 Thessalonians 3, we're in verse 17. We'll look at verse 14. Uh, let's see, 2 Thessalonians 2. Chapter 2, verse 14. 
What's he just been talking about when he says, may God, may Christ himself, even God, even our Father, establish you in every good word. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. You see what he's talking about? So when I preach this a lot, <laughs> there's a couple of reasons why I'm doing that. I'm not keeping count. I, I, what's the point in that? It's not because you're an important statistic, you know, for our little board of statistics. I literally went to a church that had a board on the wall. Last week's offering, this week's offering. Last week's attendance, this week's attendance. Make sure you know that we're... Count is going in the right direction. No, no. Um, I, I, we, we preach this and we emphasize this, the gospel, the, the word of God, the doctrine of Christ. Be established in your heart in that because it's clear in the scriptures. It's frequently emphasized in the scriptures. Am I going out of my way to talk about this this morning? The last time we talked about this, did I go out of my way to do that? We go in verse by verse, aren't we? Just just as as methodically as we can, verse by verse, through different portions of the Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Am I skipping around to different passages in the Bible so that I'm talking about what I choose to talk about instead of what God said? The whole counsel of God. And there's another reason why I stress this. It's because I'm your pastor. And I know that Christ is all, just like you do. You know that. And I also know, just like you do, that if you know the Savior at all, you'll forget it in no time, won't you? You'll forget that Christ is all when you get in this world and you get caught up in the things of this world. If, you're not, if we're not reminded... Peter said, I, I think I see that it's fit to keep you in remembrance of these things, though you know them. You know them. But you got to be reminded. Remember, he said, I'm going to do that as long as I'm in this body. I'm going to remind you that Christ is all. I am too, if, if God is pleased. And the way that we experience and are comforted in Christ is the preaching, the worship. It's not going to happen in this world. The friendship of this world is the enemies of God. And speaking of the word worship, here's what I also know and, and attend to as your pastor. The worship of God is not only the means by which God blesses his church. He, he gives, he, <laughs> he establishes us. We saw that in three places. He teaches us. He comforts us this way. Where are you going to find comfort in this world? He teaches us. Take my yoke upon you, he said, and learn of me. He gives you rest under your soul. He meets with us. Where did he say he'd meet with us? where two or three are gathered in my name for his glory, for his worship, for his sake. He communes with us. He saves sinners like this. Your loved ones, your children, your friends that you bring. He saves sinners this way. But it's also a question of honor. That's, I don't hear a lot of that, but I'm telling you right now, don't you think little of the worship of God and then wonder why your life's a disaster. I'm telling you young people right now. I've seen it way too much to wonder why. You think little of God and his worship and his word and his way, his will. Don't wonder why it all falls apart one day. It may not happen all at once, but I'm telling you right now, you thumb your nose 
in the face of God, who runs everything, who causes and brings to pass everything that happens to you every second. Don't wonder about it. Don't wonder why, because it'll be clear, won't it? I hope it'll be clear to you. And I don't mean by this that what we call bad things are not going to happen to you if you love the Lord and, and devote yourself to the Lord. They will. He said you're going to have tribulation in this world. But what I do mean is if, the, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to fear what man can do to you. If you have the fear of the Lord, you won't fear anybody else. I, I, I do mean this, no weapon formed against you in this world shall prosper. Not going to happen. I do mean this, that the overflowing scourge of the, just, just the depravity of this world won't come nigh you. Not if you're trusting in him, not if you're looking to him, not if you're honoring him in your life. I do mean this, everything will work together for your good. Everything. <laughs> How's them apples? Everything. That's the God we worship. He runs it. It comes to pass because he purposed it and brings it to pass. Remember that when you're having your fun and nothing wrong with having fun. I enjoy life. I've been enjoying it for 60 years almost. Y'all are going to hear that a lot. Now that I'm getting old, you're going to be like, for a 60-year-old, you know, I'm going to say that a lot. You'll get tired of it. Look at Psalm 112 with me. Psalm 112. Verse six, this is talking about the man that we're, you know, that, that, that God makes us when he saves us, the righteous man, righteous in Christ, righteous because of, because when God looks at us, it's not our works that he considers, it's Christ's work as our representative. It's not our sin. He doesn't see our sin. There's no iniquity found in Jacob. Why? Because Christ washed them away in his precious blood. Here's who he's talking about. He's not going to be afraid. Uh, let's look at verse 6. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteousness, the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. You may forget God for, for a little while, but he's not going to forget you. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Oh, that's what we're talking about. His heart is fixed. Fixed. This is how it happens. One of these days you're going to fall in love with him. One of these days I am. And we're going we're gonna to hold on and not let go. His heart, verse 8, his heart is established. Established in every good way, in the gospel, in the truth of Christ. And he's not going to be afraid. What time I am afraid, David said, I'll trust in you. I'll trust in you. Until he see his desire upon his enemies. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our devotion, our attendance, our applying ourselves to his counsel. He's worthy of our thanksgiving, of our taking his yoke. He's worthy of our trust. He is to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. And that happens here. All of that happens here like nowhere else. Wherever the word of God. It's not just religion talking about living the Christian life. It starts in here now. 
It starts in here. Chris decided to live with Vicky. No, <laughs> it just kind of happened, didn't it? Because I loved her. I, you see the difference? It's not a conscious, it's not I have decided to follow Jesus. He decided to set up residence in my heart. And I do exactly what I want to do. And by his grace, I, because he first loved me, I love him. I love him. There's no substitute for that. There's no imitation that will, that will hold up to that. You'll never be the loser for devoting your entire life, devoting yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, even to the leaving of houses and lands and family if he requires it. Those who do not join themselves to his church because they're anchored to a job or a house or even family that maybe won't come with them. You think about that in light of eternity. We spent this life determining that all these different things were more important than worshiping God in his church. There's no other way to say it. It's either more important or it's not. That man said, let me bury my father first and then I'll follow you. And the Lord said, let the dead bury their dead and you follow me. You're coming with me. And if he puts that in your heart, you're going to. People say that's crazy. But what's crazy is not to worship the God that made you. And if he, has, if he saved you from your sins by his son's precious blood, it's crazy not to worship him. It's crazy. I don't believe it's possible, to be honest. There is nothing in this life more important than that. You must be established in every good word and Christ himself must make that happen. And this is clearly in the scriptures how he does it. The other way that this must be true, being established in every good word is outwardly or in what you say and do. Be strong and steady in your heart when it comes to Christ and his word, but also speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Uh, let's look at a, a few scriptures. Titus 2, verse 7. Titus 2, 7 and 8. And this is getting again into the work side of it, which we'll talk about next time. But uh, Titus 2, 7 and 8. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say about you. You know how that happens? If you just give people your opinion, they're gonna, they can give you their opinion and they're going to talk down on you and they're going to say you're crazy and they're going to say uh, all the bad things about you. But if what you say is what God said, what are they going to say against that? What are they going to say against that? You show them in the scripture. You, you speak sound words, like the, like the sound speech that cannot be condemned. You're not going to be able to fight against God. You can, you can hate what God said and you can avoid it. You can avoid him. But you're not going to be able to talk against it. Not when it's right there in the scriptures. Not when it's overwhelmingly in the scriptures. 1 Peter 3 
verse 15. For so is the will of God that with, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So, oh, I'm sorry, I, you know, that's a pretty good, that's pretty well with our text too, isn't it? But it's, I'm in chapter two. Look at chapter three, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know, we don't understand everything about God. He wouldn't be God if we could understand him. But I'll tell you this, there's a reason why we believe what we believe. It's because of what God said. It's the word of God. It's the scriptures. It's the truth. And, and be ready. You know, we're not to run around casting pearls before swine, but God may just bring it to pass that somebody asks you. Don't stumble and fumble over your words. I believe the Lord will give you what to say, but be ready for that. You're not going to know what to say unless you're established in this good word. And so that's, that, that's it's, it, this is not just coming together to, 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 you know, to get a check mark by your name. The Lord's growing us in his grace for a reason. What Paul wrote to Timothy as a preacher in 2 Timothy 2 that we'll look at here pertains also to all that witness of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether in your home or in the world, everywhere God gives you an opportunity, everywhere someone asks about it or it, or it comes up to where you just can't keep quiet about it. The Lord arranged that. Look at 2 Timothy 2, 15. Again, he's talking to a young preacher here, but this applies to everybody that's a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be confident about what, you can, what you're going to say. Y'all that know me well know that it is, it's just me as a, as a person in this world there's not a whole lot that I'm just dogmatic about, you know, and I, and I don't much care, you know, I, I, um, about a lot of things. But when it comes to the word of God, there's a boldness that comes with, with knowing something about who he is. And that's, that's part of being established in his good word. You're able to answer and you're able to answer confidently. You're able to tell people about our Savior and what he did for sinners. And you're able to, to, as these other scriptures that we read say, basically shut them up about all the nonsense that they've learned in, in free will, man-centered, anti-Christ religion. They won't be able to say that stuff when you start telling them what God, showing them what God said. Some, uh, being, being established in every good word is something more than attending the preaching service and agreeing with it. That's a, that's a start, but to be doers of the word, which we'll say more about again when we look at the word work in our verse, but to be doers of the word, we must be tellers of the word. According to scripture, we are his witnesses. When Simon said we are his witnesses of these things, a witness is defined in that they are able to tell the truth of what they've seen and heard. They're able to tell something. A witness that doesn't speak is not much of a witness. We are firsthand witnesses of Christ's power and grace. Oh, we didn't see, we didn't see him heal that lame man in the book of Acts. No, but I, I saw him save my soul. I was there when that happened. I've seen him save others. I've seen, seen, seen him make people a new creature. I've, I've witnessed that. 
We've experienced it ourselves. We've experienced his grace. Who else is going to witness to that? We're character witnesses of Christ since we know him personally. Aren't you? Can you talk about his love, how much he loves sinners and has mercy on them? Can you tell people who he is? We can tell how that he's mighty to save. When somebody says, you know, that, that the Lord is trying to do something, you can say, hold on a minute. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a character witness of, of the son of God. He don't do that. That's not him. Then when he loves somebody, he saves them. He loves and. We can tell and we can sing of sovereign grace. We can testify that he came where we were. That salvation is of the Lord. Jonah could testify that, right? When Jonah said salvation is of the Lord, he knew what he was talking about, didn't he? Don't we? What Paul is praying for in our text is that we might be made by Christ himself expert witnesses. Now, we would never call, call ourselves experts on anything. Paul said, I don't know anything as I ought to know, and, and, and not that we can decide anything of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. But think about it. Who else can testify expertly of the one that we, we know, we would know and be established and sound and knowledgeable in the scripture so that we, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16, might speak the wisdom of God. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The world can't possibly know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, but he showed them to us. He's showed them to us. We have the mind of Christ. That's an expert witness, whether you want to call yourself that or not. Remember the framework of that passage too. That passage where he's talking about that, where people, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God hath revealed unto us. But he, but he did reveal them unto us. The framework of that passage, the beginning of that passage, 1 Corinthians 2, we're, we're talking about verses 6 through 16. If you want to read that later, I was going to read it. But the beginning of that chapter, the framework of the whole passage, the wisdom that we speak, the discernment that we have is expressed in that we determine to know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What makes us expert witnesses of Christ? Though we would never consider ourselves that. 2 Timothy 3. Let's close with this. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And, and just, you know, how, how, how do we place a value on this? This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. He said, you're the salt of the earth. He said, you're the light of the world. We know that he's the light of the world, but he said, you're the light of the world too. Because we know him, because we're able to tell what he told. We're able to tell what he did for sinners and how he did it and why he did it. A man don't light a candle and put it under a bushel but he sets it on the table so that everybody that comes in can bask in that light, can see by that light. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, I'm sorry, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that. What is it that, that brings us here? The scripture. Scripture is profitable for these things. Not your thinking about it a lot. <laughs> Somebody said, well, I've been giving this a lot of thought and here's what this... 
Just tell what God said. Just tell what God said. For instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect, that is, complete. We are complete how? Where? In him. In him. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And next time, Lord willing, we'll talk about being established in every good work. But I'll tell you this right now. There's no more important. There's no gooder work than telling sinners about the Savior. There's no greater expression of love for somebody than telling them who Christ is and what he did to reconcile sinners unto himself. May God establish us in his gospel. Amen. Let's pray.